Pre class, welcome to chapter four of developmental biology. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk a bit about cell to cell communications. As you can see, this is kind of the uh, cell membrane uh, here with this structure uh, coming out of it. We're going to talk about what these structures are uh, and talk about how uh, cell to cell communications and kind of location is uh, important in developmental biology. For those of you that are using the textbook uh, along with this class, which uh, theoretically it should be all of you, um, but for those of you that are kind of using it as a guide, uh, I've included here kind of the, um, the chapter breakdown uh, that mirrors your textbook so you can kind of get an idea of where these slides are coming from within the textbook and kind of orient yourself that way so in case you don't uh, understand the way I explain it and you need to go back, you have an easy reference point for that. So cell to cell signaling happens in kind of two classifications. You have local signaling or juxtaprint signaling, uh, which is uh, kind of this physical connection. And that's when these membrane bound receptors bind to extracellular proteins uh, or the membrane bound receptors of a neighboring cell. So uh, here you see that these proteins kind of span uh, two cells where there's a kind of an interconnection between them. Um, the other type of uh, signaling or paracrine signaling, uh, this is long distance signaling or longer distance signaling. And this can happen, or this happens when the cell uh, excretes uh, uh, signaling molecules. Uh, in this case, we have these signaling uh, proteins that we call ligands. And these ligands can travel between cells and they bind to um, specified receptors that are specific to this, their own ligand. So there's a one receptor, kind of one ligand um, uh, relationship. And uh, response, once the signaling happens, can be fast or slow. So a fast uh, response would be some sort of chemical reaction that happens in the cytosol. Um, and slow would be a kind of a cascading pathway that leads to changes in gene expression. And uh, it's important uh, when we're looking at this uh, juxtaprint signaling, to notice that there's two different types of, bind, uh, of binding. We have homophilic binding, and that's where a receptor binds to the same receptor in another cell. So this receptor binds to its twin within another cell. And then there's this heterophilic binding where a receptor only binds to its specified partner that's different. So instead of binding to itself, it would bind to a partner protein that has a different makeup uh, than the protein does itself. So how do cells separate into tissues and remain separate uh, is a big question in developmental biology. And so in this classic experiment, uh, amphibian cells from the epidermis, uh, uh, epidermis and the neural plate were extracted and an alkaline solution was used to break all the bonds between the cells. And so, uh, as you can see here, uh, we have the extraction of the epidermis cells and we have the extraction of the neural plate cells and an alkaline solution was used to just make kind of a big pile of randomly assorted cells. And so they put these cells back together and allowed them to adhere again. And lo and behold, these cells reorganized themselves into their respective tissues. And so you had neural cells that started to bind to other uh, neural cells, and you had epidermis cells here that re-aggregated only with the neural cells. So instead of this random adhesion uh, that we would kind of expect uh, if there was no uh, mechanism for uh, segregation, uh, instead they did segregate into their respective tissues. And we're gonna talk about how that is possible and how that occurs. This select affinity held true for multiple different tissue types. So here uh, we have combinations of uh, epidermis, mesoderm, uh, the endoderm, um, and we see that if we disrupt this tissue, uh, the, there is a um, positive affinity between the ectoderm or the epidermis uh, and the mesoderm. So the epidermis wants to bind to the mesoderm and be on the outside of that. Um, but there is a negative affinity between the ectoderm or the epidermis, the outermost layer, and the endoderm, the innermost layer, right? Because they shouldn't be touching each other. We should have the mesoderm in between. Um, but as you can see, in all these different combinations of tissues, we have a whole bunch of 
uh, examples of how they orient themselves and they want to be with their partners and not necessarily um, uh, all mixed together like we see in these uh, first mixtures. So there's this self-organizing property of these tissues because of their uh, receptors and their ability to recognize their neighbors. So we can really break it down and kind of model this with this uh, differential adhesion uh, hypothesis. And so imagine A, B, and C are the uh, epidermis, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And uh, we think of it as uh, if A is always outside or within B, and if B is always within C, then A is always within C, right? And so that's kind of this uh, self-organizing property. And so um, it's, it's kind of a logic thing, uh, which is if you have an opportunity to take a logic class, it is very uh, interesting and, and one of my favorite classes I've ever taken. Um, but you can kind of diagram this out and have kind of an, an analogy. So if it rains today, I will wear my rain jacket. If I wear my rain jacket, I will keep dry. Therefore, if it rains today, I will keep dry. And so the same principle can be applied to uh, these tissue types. So if one's inside the other, if uh, A is within B and B is within C, then A must be within C. So it's this kind of uh, um, this differential adhesion adhesion hypothesis really breaks down um, th these relationships between tissue types. So the way that these cells adhere to one another of their own tissue type is through this molecule called cadherin. And these molecules bind to uh, the same uh, cadherin mo uh, molecules on other cells. So it kind of forms this uh, structure to hold together uh, the same cell types. And so um, this is dependent on uh, calcium binding. So you need calcium present for these bonds to happen between. And that's why we can kind of break these bonds with um, uh, alkaline solutions and things of that nature. And so these are transmembrane proteins. So they go across uh, the cellular membranes. You can see here this kind of uh, uh, phospholipid bilayer. And these molecules go across that uh, and then they're anchored uh, to the actin cytoskeleton um, through these proteins called catenins. And these catenins uh, just kind of uh, build this bridge between these uh, cadherins and uh, the inner structure within the cell. And so if you remove uh, the cadherins, then what happens is these cells disaggregate. So they kind of fall out of tissue and they just kind of float around by themselves. Like we saw in that, uh, those previous uh, couple experiments where you can kind of make a mismatch of cells by chemically treating them to break these bonds. Um, and so uh, what's important with this, uh, one of the aspects that's important is that this anchoring to the actin cytoskeleton allows these uh, cadherins to transduce signals um, between cells and that can lead to changes in gene expression. So the mechanism of actually um, affecting change within the cell is because they're linked, um, the cadherins to these actin cytoskeletons through those catenin proteins. So the amount and type of cadherin molecules that are on the cell membrane of the cell helps determine the morphogenesis and the uh, structure and organization of the tissue. And so there is a direct relationship between the strength of the bonds between these cells and the number of the cadherin molecules on the outside. So if you have more of these molecules looking to form bonds, then when they do form bonds, it's stronger, right? Because there's more of these bonds to break apart. And so cells with a lot of these cadherin molecules will attra uh, be attracted to other cells with a lot as well, because they want to satisfy those, those connections and those bonds um, and make sure that everybody's connected and not just kind of floating around out there. And so in this example here, we have these two cell types that are stained. We have green cells and red cells. And the green cells have two and a, or almost two and a half times more n cadherin, so the specific uh, type of uh, cadherin molecule, than the red cells do. And so when you jumble them up and let them reorganize, because those green cells have more connections, they're going to form a bond together. Um, so on the inside here, where I drew the squiggly line, um, 
they have more bonds and they want to connect with each other more than they want to connect with the red cells. So those red cells are forced to the periphery, to the outside of this tissue formation um, and, and bond to each other because they have less of those um, coherence. And so if you manipulate the different types and amounts of coherence, you can kind of change this cellular structure. So down at then C here, uh, we have p-cadherin, which is a specific type which will only bind to other p-cadherin molecules. And if you have more p-cadherin than e-cadherin, then the red cells, which have more, will bond strongly to each other in the middle. If they're equal, then there's no uh, desire, there's no additional bonds that need to be filled, so you just have this jumbled mess, right? Um, there's P doesn't have more than E and E doesn't have more than P, so they'll be happy just bonding to each other. But then conversely, if you have cells where there's more of the E coherent uh, uh, binding molecule, they will bind preferentially with themselves. And you see that compared to the first example here, the green cells are now within the, within the inside of the tissue formation because they need those E coherent bonds, since there's a lot more of them, they'll be able to kind of aggregate together more strongly and then the red p coherent cells are forced to the outside because they have less of those signaling or less of those binding molecules uh, and those that force isn't as strong as within the green. So not only is the quantity of the coherent molecules uh, important, but also the quality and uh, so the type and timing of the expression of the incoherent molecules. So you can see an example A here, um, we have uh, cells that are expressing uh, R and B coherence, which are two different types of coherence. And as you can see, they don't mix very well. So they would rather bond to themselves as opposed to each other because uh, the R and B coherence just don't have this affinity for one another. Um, and so this property makes it important for uh, the formation of boundaries uh, between different tissues. And so, uh, for example, uh, embryonic cells initially express uh, E coherence, and they eventually, that leads to the development of the neural tube, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but once uh, these neural tubes are formed, they lose these E coherent expressions and start expressing N coherence. Uh, and that separates those uh, cells from the non neural tu uh, tube tissue around it. And so as you can see here, we have uh, the E coherent molecules that are expressed on the outer layer and then the N coherence expression uh, kind of on the inner layer of this neural tube uh, formation. And so taken together, you have this properly formed neural tube. So we're kind of looking down the tube, like it's going into the screen there. And um, if you get rid of N coherent, which was important for creating this kind of fissure formation, beginning formation of the neural tube, what happens is these E coherence kind of overpower and that, uh, that layer that is formed because N coherence and E coherence don't really form well together, that, uh, or they don't bond well together, that feature is lost because the E coherence then come in just, as you can see, they proliferate throughout the entire uh, structure and there's no boundary created anymore. And so these different coherent types are, are very good uh, avenues for creating boundaries between, between things. So it's important to remember that uh, these cell-to-cell -cell interactions don't happen by themselves or in a vacuum. Uh, that the environment actually plays a role on these, uh, these interactions. And <clears throat> this environment that's surrounding the cell is called the extracellular matrix. So it's outside the cell or extracellular, and it's a matrix of macromolecules and other components that uh, kind of create this environment that the cell is you know, exposed to, is in. And these macromolecules form a region um, of non-cellular material, so this extracellular, these macromolecules, um, in the interstices between cells. So this region between cells, uh, there's like a little bit of room there where those coherins uh, are able to interact with one another and it's filled with these uh, uh, macromolecules. And so cell adhesion 
Um, and uh, for instance, migration of the epithelial sheet, which we'll get into, all depend on uh, these attachments with this extracellular matrices. So we'll get more in, uh, information on this in the coming uh, lectures. So some of these extracellular matrices components in, uh, that exist are things like uh, collagen and proteoglycans um, and glycoproteins such as fibronectin and laminin, which we'll talk about more throughout this course. Uh, fibronectin is a, a big uh, glycoprotein which is kind of an adhesive molecule that kind of sticks everything together. It's kind of the glue of this extracellular matrices. Um, and it has multiple binding sites and uh, it interacts with its designated binding partners. And through this mechanism, uh, you can get the proper orientation of cells within a cellular matrix. So it's kind of the backbone of, of this extracellular matrix that allows uh, proper orientation. And so it also lines the roads over which cells migrate. So we're going to get into cells migrating through the velastopore and uh, into the cell and, and how that all happens. And the fibronectin are these roadways that the cells will migrate um, throughout. And so uh, an example of this is uh, cells for the gonad in the heart um, need to migrate. And so they follow this fibronectin road to get to the inside of the developing embryo uh, to ensure that their development of those special cell lines, gonads and hearts, uh, occur in the proper location and not on the outside of the organism. So laminin and collagen uh, make up the basal lamina, uh, which is this uh, one type of extracellular matrices. And so you can see them here, you have the basal lamina and the collagen, and then the epithelium or the tissue. And you can kind of see in the background some of these cells uh, that are adhering to it. And so the basal lamina, lamina uh, form these closely knit sheets underneath the epithelial tissue. It's kind of like a, a baseboard, so to speak. Um, and adhesion of these cells uh, to the laminin it is, uh, of epithelial cells specifically, is greater than the affinity of mesenchymal cells uh, for fibronectin. And so there's uh, a very stickiness of these epithelial cells. And the reason is that these mesenchymal cells that are connected to fibronectin as opposed to that laminin basal lamina, um, they need to be released and be able to migrate. And like I said, we'll get more into this whole migration stuff uh, in the coming chapters, um, but it can't be as tightly bound um, as the epithelial, which is more stationary. So there's a special class of protein called integrins, which are um, proteins that span the uh, bilipid membrane um, and they give the cell the ability to interact with its surrounding environment. Um, and so in this instance, uh, we have uh, these integrins that are binding to fibronectin and so they can bind with either glycoproteins uh, or laminin uh, or fibronectin uh, depending on the specific integrin. So they kind of have a specificity to them. Uh, so the main fibronectin receptor, which is shown here, um, is an extremely large protein kind of complex that binds to fibronectin. So you can see the extracellular matrices fibronectin uh, up here up on the top. Um, and it spans the membrane of the cell and attaches eventually here uh, to this actin cytoskeleton. Uh, and you see you have the actin uh, filament here. So in essence, what, you, what the result is, um, is a protein that is out in the extracellular matrices and kind of an avenue to pass information from the extracellular uh, comp uh, component of the developing organism to the inside of the cell. And so through these connections, uh, you can take signals from the outside of the cell, kind of interpret them, and then have a change in gene expression or uh, chemical changes as well that lead to that cell differentiating or performing a different function or changing its strategy, et cetera. Okay, so let's look at how cells interact with the basal lamina and what that means. And so in this example here, we have mouse mammary cells, so cells that are going to be uh, used for lactation and uh, feeding the next generation. So in this case here, we've extracted some uh, mouse mammary cells and we expose them to no basal lamina. Uh, 
And since there's no basal lamina around, they don't have the information from their neighbors. And they'll continue to divide. And these cells on the top here, uh, sea mice uh, and cyclin D1, are turned on. And those are for cells or uh, genes specific to division and growth of this tissue. And you can see that these other genes, uh, lactoferrin, casein, and WAP, which are genes specific for milk production, those genes are turned off. But now, if we expose that basal lamina to these mammary cells, instead, they take that positional information knowing that they're wrapped up in the basal lamina, and they turn off these cell division cells, or uh, genes. And so they're able to realize that they're in contact with the basal lamina, and they say, okay, we're in the right spot. We're going to move on from cell division and we're going to activate lactoferrin and P21, which are genes more involved with uh, production of milk. So what will happen is these mammary cells will be enveloped or wrapped up with the basal lamina. And now you can see that we've also added casein uh, genes, which are turned on, and the cell division uh, genes are still off. And at the very end, we also add WAP, and we formed this kind of uh, specialized tissue where these mammary cells are going to produce milk proteins. And you can see they get secreted into the middle of this developed milk gland uh, because of their contact with the basal lamina. So the positional information is really important for these cells to realize what stage they're in. Because as you can see in A, if they don't have contact with this extracellular matrix and they don't know their environment, they're just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. But once they know that they're in contact with uh, this extracellular matrix, which is uh, kind of positional information, they know that they can move on to become a functional tissue or a gland in this case. So let's kind of synthesize all this information that we have and kind of put it all together. And so, this is an example of epithelial mesenchymal transition, so epithelial tissue transitioning to mesenchymal tissue, and it integrates all the processes that we've talked about so far. So normally epithelial cells are attached to one another through uh, adherent, uh, adherence junctions uh, that contain uh, cadherin, uh, catenins, and actin rings. So these are kind of in between uh, the cells here, so that's what uh, uh, causes them to stick together in these epithelial cells. Um, and they are attached to the basal lamina down at the bottom, and they're attached to the basal lamina through integrins. And so uh, paracrine factors, which remember these kind of uh, excreted uh, little uh, proteins, these paracrine factors uh, can repress expressions of genes that encode these cellular components, such as cadherins and actin and things like that, um, and uh, catenins. Um, and uh, this can cause the cell to lose their polarity and also break down these junctions in between cells. And what it will also do uh, is some cytoskeleton uh, remodeling as well as excrete some proteases. So proteases are enzymes that break down proteins and that will degrade the basal lamina. So they cause the expression of genes specifically to break down that basal lamina in these other extracellular matrix uh, molecules. Um, and so what will happen then is now that you can see you've broken all the bonds between this epithelial cell and its surrounding components, the other epithelial cells next to it and the basal lamina below it. And what will happen is this cell will transition into a mesenchyme cell. And because it's not associated with the epithelia or the basal lamina anymore, it'll kind of squeeze out of that position and allow those existing epithelial cells to reform their bonds between each other. And it's kind of just like left the party, so to speak. Um, and so this process, uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition, uh, is seen during embry embryo development. We'll get more into when it happens in the next couple of chapters, um, but it's really important for neural crest development. Neural crest is the uh, kind of um, pre uh, precursor to development of the spinal cord and the central nervous system. Um, and so they have to migrate to a specific spot uh, to further that development. Um, and so 
if you look at this and think of this from, I know a lot of you are pre-med, if you think of this from a medical standpoint, this also rem uh, resembles a um, non-ordinary or uh, non-desired uh, um, occurrence that happens, and it kind of resembles metastasism, right? And so um, there's a lot of similarities between this process when a tumor metastasizes and you hear, oh, it spread to his liver, spread to his lungs. And uh, that's because these cells have kind of a similar process where they're able to uh, migrate um, and remove their uh, connections to the basal lamina or other tissues, other uh, tumor tissues, and transfer to other parts of the body. So what makes a cell's position relevant? Um, you know, cell position uh, is important for adhesion and migration differentiation, the example we just had in the last slide, um, as well as cell division. Um, and this is all um, relevated, or, uh, regulated, excuse me, by cell-to-cell -cell signaling. And there are these things called paracrine factors that we talked about earlier, which are secreted into the extracellular matrix and affect nearby cells. So I want to, uh, at this point, take a moment to differentiate between um, these paracrine factors and endocrine factors. So paracrine factors are um, long range compared to juxtacrine factors, but long range, it's kind of a middle range, right? So it's only, it's, it's secreted into the extracellular matrix and it's only nearby cells. This is opposed to endocrine factors, which are uh, part of the endocrine system, which I'm sure you you're familiar with from your previous biology classes, those are factors that are excreted, uh, excreted into the bloodstream and travel much, much further. So endocrine factors, you know, you're kind of staying in the neighborhood um, and uh, these, or sorry, uh, jet, <laughs> sorry, paracrine factors, you stay in the neighborhood, right? So it's just local signaling uh, to a few cells down. Um, but endocrine factors are in the bloodstream and they can travel throughout the full body, the entire body. So induction is interaction between uh, uh, two cells or tissues at close range. Let's, uh, let's insert a W here that is a typo. <laughs> um, it, so, and then within this induction, you have inducers and responders. So inducer uh, is the tissue that uh, induces uh, or produces the signal. Um, and this is often through paracrine factors. Um, and a responder is the cell that, or tissue that is being induced. So it's responding to these paracrine factors. Um, and so for them to respond, they have to have these receptor proteins on the outside of the cell to be able to recognize and respond to those paracrine factors. Um, and this uh, response, you can, I kind of covered it up with my video here, uh, being able to respond is termed, termed, I mean, I apologize for my poor mouse driven writing here, but it's termed competence. So able, being able to respond uh, is termed competence. So within these interactions, there's a couple of uh, different mechanisms that are in play. And so we have two types of interactions. We have instructive interaction, uh, which is when a signal from the inducer, so the tissue sending out those paracrine factors, is required for new gene expression. And so that tissue won't differentiate until it gets a signal from the surrounding neighbor, or those surrounding cells, those paracrine factors, um, to tell it to start differentiating. But then there's also permissive interaction. And that's where the tissues already began uh, to specify, so it's starting down that path, um, but it requires an environmental change of those paracrine factors um, to allow more finalized gene expression to occur that cause that tissue to cement differentiation. So permissive means it's already down the road but needs that nudge to finish, and instructive means that those cells won't differentiate unless those paracrine factors are sent out to tell it to do so. Sometimes this induction process happens both ways. Um, and so in eye development, uh, 
there is this ectodermal tissue that surrounds an optic vesicle. And that optic vesicle, it secretes paracrine factors and tells that surrounding ectodermal tissue to become lens tissue. So the lens of your eye on the outside, right? Once that lens tissue is formed, the lens tissue then secretes paracrine factors back to that optic vesicle and tell that optic vesicle to proceed on to becoming the optic cup. So they talk both ways. So one says, you become the lens. And then once it becomes the lens, it says, okay, now you become the optic cup. Um, and so it can kind of be a, a positive feedback loop or this kind of two-way street. And these interactions are called reciprocal inductions, right? So reciprocal meaning going both ways or tit for tat. Um, and so that is one example of a reciprocal induction. So we can, the extracellular matrix plays a very big role in this uh, cell differentiation, right? And so this is a really cool experiment, at least I think so, um, where they took a rat's heart. And as you can see here, we have the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the aorta. And they added SDS. Um, so if any of you do protein work in any of the labs you work in, SDS page is something that kind of de uh, it kind of breaks apart proteins or it makes them dissociate from one another. Um, and what you're left with, because it only tar uh, targets proteins, is only this extracellular matrix. And so that's all the, the proteoglycans and things that surround these, uh, these cells when they're in tissue form, right? And so after that, they put that extracellular matrix into a bioreactor with these undifferentiating or these not yet differentiating uh, heart cells and allow them to kind of rebuild that heart because they have the positional information from that intact extracellular matrix and they're able to kind of reconstitute heart tissue and from that they can actually get a beating heart because uh, you know all the ingredients are there for this tissue formation. And so this is just kind of an example of how the extracellular matrix helps to distinguish what these uh, tissues will develop into. So the interaction between uh, the epithelium, the outer layer, and the mesenchyme, the middle layer, is really important in determining what type of uh, specified tissue or uh, features develop. And so in this example here, we have a, uh, I believe, 10-day-old chick embryo. And you can see um, here it's stained to show the expression of sonic hedgehog, uh, a gene that's really important we'll get more into in development. Um, and that's the dark little spots there that are kind of forming on the feathers. But with this uh, experiment, uh, what they did and what they showed is that if you take, <coughs> excuse me, if you take epithelium from the wing, so that right up here somewhere on this chick, you would expect that it would develop into feathers, right? Because that's what's present. However, if you combine that epithelium with different mesenchyme parts, so you could have mesenchyme that was extracted from the wing, from the thigh, or from the foot, you have a different outcome. So if you have it wing mesenchyme and wing epithelium, you get wing feathers. If you have thigh uh, mesenchyme and wing epithelium, you have thigh feathers. And if you have foot mesenchyme and foot er, and wing epithelium, you get uh, scales and claws that are uh, present on feet. And so what this shows us is that uh, the epithelium isn't really determining these features, but the mesenchyme is. And this is because the epithelial cells send out signal proteins to the mesenchyme and say, what do I need to divide into? Or what do I need to specify into? And then the mesenchyme in return sends paracrine factors back. And those factors say, I am wing mesenchyme, so you need to develop uh, feathers. Or I am thigh mesenchyme, and this is the thigh, so you need to develop thigh feathers, etc. And so it's this interaction between the epithelium and the mesenchyme that leads to this differentiation. It's not the epithelium itself, the outermost tissue, but the interaction between the mesenchyme and the epithelium that causes the development of these specialized features. So even though the mesenchyme and surrounding tissues can direct neighboring tissues what to develop into, they can only respond with the genes that they have. 
And so in this example here, we have two similar organisms, a frog and a newt. And what they did is they took the mouth area of this gastrula, the area that fate maps to become the mouth, and transplanted it into the same uh, area that's expected to be the mouth of a newt. And so the surrounding tissue, like the mesenchyme in our last example, instructed that new transplanted tissue, this is the area that becomes mouth. So we know you're in the right spot to become mouth. So go ahead and develop into mouth tissue. However, when that frog gastrula or that frog tissue received the message from the rest of the gastrula, it says, okay, I'll become a mouth, but I became, it became a frog mouth, became a tadpole mouth, because that's the only genes it has to respond. It can't implement new genes because it doesn't have those. It only has its frog genes. And so the reciprocal was done too. So they took newt gastrula that was going to develop into uh, the mouth and transplanted it into the gastrula of a frog that the same area would develop into the mouth. And they found again that the frog mesenchyme tissue responded to the epithelium and said, you're in the area to become a mouth. And so the newt tissue, not knowing that the mesenchyme signal was coming from frog, it just sees mesenchyme signal says, okay, I've been told to become a mouth. And it becomes a newt mouth region, and with these little balancer fins too, um, on a tadpole, the rest of the body. And so the, the kind of sum of the story here is that even though the mesenchyme tells the epithelium what to develop into, it still can only use its own DNA to build those structures. Those genes within each cell are responsible for creating the structure. So to sum this up, two factors affect the induction between the epithelia and the mesenchyme. And that's the regional specificity, um, and that's saying the region uh, determines what the tissue will uh, develop into if it's competent, if it's able to receive that message and respond. So that was our chicken example where uh, the region that the mesenchyme came from told the epithelial what to respond by. And the other specificity is genetic specificity. So the tissue that's being induced can only respond with its own genes. It can't take up new genes or take genes from a newt and put them into frog cells. So it gets the message it says, that says, turn into mouth tissue, and it says, okay, I'll use the mouth genes that I have. They just happen to be frog uh, mouth genes or whatever. So the region and the genetics of those cells that are being induced play a role in the development of these uh, specialized features. So there are two major types of uh, inducers and then one subtype. It says at the top of the slide there, there's two types, but there's two main types and then one subtype. So juxtaprint interactions or membrane proteins on one cell surface interact with the receptor proteins on the adjacent or juxtaposed surface. So those are those physical membrane spanning proteins that uh, interact. And then paracrine interaction, as we've talked about, is when proteins synthesized by one cell diffuse over a small distance. Remember, it's not endocrine, but paracrine, so about 15 cells, um, and can diffu diffuse over the small distance and interact with neighboring cells. But then within paracrine interactions, there's what we call autocrine interactions. And this is just a modified paracrine interaction. And that's where the inducer cells create paracrine factors that are excreted into the extracellular matrix, but they also have receptors to respond to their own uh, um, paracrine factors that are being sent out. So they send out a signal, but also respond to the uh, signal. So we call those autocrine uh, interactions. So now we're going to talk a little bit about specific factors, uh, which are called morphogens. And morphogens, as you'd expect, are um, things that cause changes in um, shape or morphology, right? And so there's really four families of morphogens, and these are kind of classified based on their structure. Um, there's S, uh, FGF, which is fibroblast growth factor. We'll probably just refer to it as FGF from here. Um, there's the hedgehog, sonic hedgehog, and its family of other hedgehog genes. There's the WNT family, and then there's this TGF beta super family, which consists of a bunch of different little uh, uh, groups within it. It's kind of the catch-all family, and it has TGF beta, uh, activin, uh, the bone morphogenic proteins, nodal, 
uh, VG1 and several other proteins. And so we'll get a little more into these specifically. So morphogens, as I kind of alluded to in the last factor, last slide, are paracrine factors that regulate gene expression, and they are kind of concentration based. And so as we talked about when we were talking about our gradients before, when we have a cell that's secreting these uh, uh, paracrine factors, the further you get from that source, the less likely there are to be those factors. So you kind of you know, thin out as you go over distance. And so depending on the amount of those paracrine factors and thus in uh, also the distance because that's associated or directly correlated with the amount of paracrine factors, uh, we have different tissues that can develop. So as you see here, we have that secreting cell, the source, and then at a certain threshold, all of the cells that have that minimum amount, this threshold one, minimum amount of that paracrine factor present will develop into this specific maroon colored tissue. Cells that have less than threshold one, but more than threshold two, will develop into this pink tissue source. And then cells that have very little of the paracrine factor will develop into a third tissue source. And so these, the distance and concentration are directly correlated and thus they also play a role in the type of tissue based on this concentration. We'll talk a little bit now of how these paracrine factors interact with receptors. And so when a paracrine factor binds to a receptor, it can cause two things to happen. One is it can call, cause the, a change in gene expression. And so if you're going to differentiate into a tissue, you can receive the signal and then turn those specific genes on or off that are required to become a certain tissue. Or it can cause regulation of the cytoskeleton or cytoskeleton remodeling um, which allows cells to kind of migrate around. And we call these uh, two types of um, outcomes from paracrine binding uh, signal transduction cascades. So in a previous slide, we looked at the concentration gradients that occur and uh, lead to different uh, tissue formation. <clears throat> so here we have that same graph, but we're gonna look at the kind of in practice how this works. And so in this experiment, unspecified amphibian cells were kind of put in a cluster. And within the middle of this cluster, there were these beads that contain that paracrine factor, in this case, activin. And so in the first example here, we have beads that were added and there was no activin. And that caused the cells surrounding it not to specify, they remain unspecified cells. In the second part of the experiment, they put the same beads in the middle, but this time the beads contained one nanomolar or a very low concentration of activin. And that caused nearby cells to express this expra and start to differentiate. And so remember in that graph down here at the bottom, that was these differentiation into these pink cell types. Now, in the third part of the experiment, they upped the ante a bit and they coated the beads with four nanomolars of activin. And at that high concentration, you have a diffusing gradient from those beads outwards, and the closest cells will exp uh, express a gene called guscoid, which leads to de the development of uh, a highly ex uh, expressed amount of goose guscoid excuse me, protein, which cause cell differentiation. And then a little further out, we have expression of that expra because that is reliant on a medium concentration of uh, this activin. And you get differentiation into this pink tissue. And then further out where there's very low concentrations of activin diffusing to, you get unspecified cells. So this is just kind of showing uh, how this figure that we saw before relating the distance and concentration of a morphogen, activin for this case, uh, causes differentiation based on distance from the source. So now we're gonna start to get into those four uh, families of receptors that we had talked about uh, in a previous slide. And so the first one we're gonna talk about is this tyrosine kinase. 
And tyrosine kinase is a transmembrane protein where you have a ligand binding domain in the extracellular matrix. So that's able to receive and respond to paracrine factors. And then it has a uh, tyrosine kinase domain in the cytoplasm that kind of relays that message from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So when a ligand or a paracrine factor binds to this tyrosine kinase, what happens is the message gets kind of transversed across the membrane and it leads to activation of the tyrosine kinase. And this happens through phosphorylation. You can see these phosphorylation uh, marks here on the tyrosine kinase. And what that does is it allows that tyrosine kinase, the intercellular domain, to become active. And that activation will then respond by taking an inactive protein that responds uh, that it has a, a job within the cell, and through the use of ATP, giving it energy, it will phosphorylate that inactive protein and activate it. And as you know, proteins are the kind of results-oriented part of the cell. Proteins actually carry out function genes, and so this active protein will then go and carry off some sort of um, molecular or biochemical cascade throughout the cell. And so this is a very, very generalized version of how tyrosine kinases work, um, but it just kind of relays the message of how paracrine factors can interact with cells and cause changes across the cellular membrane. So as said in the last slide, the tyrosine kinase example was a very basic example. And so we're going to get into FGF, or the fibroblast growth factor, and talk about this much more in-depth pathway. And so this is the RTK pathway where FGF are these kinases here that span the membrane, similar to those tyrosine kinases. And for binding of a ligand, they require two bound HSPGs, which are heparin sulfite proteoglycans. So it's, it's kind of a requirement of the extracellular matrix. And that's required for stable binding of those ligands. And so binding causes uh, these RTK uh, FGF proteins to dimerize, so they have to function together in pairs for proper binding. And once they dimerize and are bound to both HSPGs up here and to the ligand, then it causes the two uh, transmembrane proteins to phosphorylate one another. Once phosphorylated, an adapter protein will bind to the tail end, the intercellular domain, of this uh, transmembrane protein, this kinase, and will link with this GEF uh, protein. So the role of this adapter protein is really just to, it's an adapter, it, it is to link up GEF with this transmembrane kinase uh, FGF protein. Now GEF's role is to energize through the conversion of GDP to GTP, RAS, this RAS protein down here. So you can think of the first part of this pathway, I'll kind of circle it in green here, is your, the outcome is to energize RAS. So this just sets up the energi uh, energizing of RAS after a ligand has been bound to the receptor. Now, once RAS is energized, it will recruit RAF, which interacts with MEK via phosphorylation. And MEK itself is a kinase, so kinase is a protein that phosphorylates other proteins. Um, and MEK will phosphorylate ERK, which then goes into the nucleus and it activates transcription factors. And those transcription factors, as we talked about in the previous chapters, these transcription factors will then change gene expression. So they'll either turn on uh, or turn off genes. And so in this entire pathway, I know it's a lot to, to digest and it's kind of convoluted, but what you're getting is this cascade where a ligand is perceived by these transmembrane proteins and through this these different interactions where uh, SOS recruits GEF, which energizes RAS, which then recruits RAF, 
which then phosphorylates MEK, which then phosphorylates ERK, and then causes transcription, you start with sensing a ligand and then changing transcription within the cell. So the hedgehog pathway is kind of convoluted and, and uh, very intricate. So I'm going to try to break it down as best I can uh, to kind of the key components. And so we have these membrane uh, hedgehog receptors, uh, IHOG and BOI. And when no ligand is uh, bound to them, this protein in between them called patched will prevent smoothened from being active. And if that happens, then this big microtubule complex over here, that allows SLIM to cut the CI protein in half. And when that happens, these have proteins will go and bind to the operator of a gene and repress gene expression. And similarly, that's in Drosophila. And similarly, in vertebrates, we have a very similar mechanism where we have GAS1 and Bach, which are kind of analogous to IHOG and BOI. And what they, the same thing happens, where there's no uh, factor bound, we have smoothened repressed, so it's not able to, to do anything. And that microtubule network, again, will allow PKA so the difference here is that SLIM does the cutting in Drosophila and PKA does the cutting in uh, vertebrates. PKA will come in and cut this GLI protein in half. And just like in Drosophila, that one half fact, uh, fraction of GLI will go and repress gene expression. So if no hedgehog is bound to these receptors, you get a, this GLI or CI protein cut in half and represses expression. That's kind of the key takeaways from this. Now, conversely, when hedgehog is present, it binds to boy and IHOG up here, and that causes smoothened to be allowed to exist. It's not repressed anymore because uh, there's uh, degradation of this uh, protein. And so smoothened then goes and interacts with this big microtubule network that we saw before. And what it does is it prevents PKA and SLIM from cutting this CI molecule in half. And because that molecule, or that not molecule, protein, because that CI protein is not cut in half, it doesn't repress, but instead activates gene expression. And so if we look at the vertebrate uh, side of this, we have a very similar mechanism where hedgehog binds to these uh, membrane-bound receptors and causes the uh, degradation of the protein that represses smoothened. Smoothened then goes and it stops PKA from cutting GLI in half. And because it stops that, GLI can go and activate instead of repress. So in both of these instances, if hedgehog's not bound, a signaling pe uh, cascade is created that cuts CI or GLI in half, and they act as repressors then and stop gene expression. But if hedgehog does bind, then through the, use, the activation of smoothen, we prevent CI or GLI from being cut in half, and that protein acts as an activator of transcription and turns genes on. So you can see how if hedgehog's present, genes are turned off, and if hedgehog, or sorry, if hedgehog's present, genes are turned on, and if hedgehog is not present, genes are turned off. So now let's look at the key aspects of the WNT pathway, our third uh, family of, of paracrine receptors and responders. So, WNT is a paracrine factor, and if no paracrine factor or WNT is present, then what happens is there's these beta catenin uh, molecules or proteins within the cell. And in the state where no WNT is present, WNT is present, uh, this beta catenin will be ubiquitin ubiquitinated. And what ubiquitin does is it signals to the proteasome 
what should be broken down. So you don't, if you want to exist, you don't want ubiquitin tags added to you. But because no WNT is present, it gets the ubiquitin tag and that protein is broken down and we have no gene expression. Now, if WNT is present, it binds to this purple one over here called frizzle and also this LRP5 slash six protein, the green one. And that causes the or intercellular domains of these cross membrane proteins to take away some of those key components that are responsible for ubiquitination. And so because they're all bound up here, they're not able to stop and ubiquitinate beta catenin. And because that happens, this beta catenin is not broken down by the proteasome. You notice there's no uh, pieces of catenin over here. And it can go into the nucleus and it can bind to these transcription factors and cause the transcription of different genes. So if it's not present, they get uh, beta catenin gets ubiquitinated and there is no gene expression. But when WNT is present, there is no ubiquitin tags added and it's allowed to go and uh, start uh, gene expression. Now let's look at the TGF, our last group of receptors, TGF beta. And so TGF beta is this family of receptors where two different receptors, a type two and a type one receptor is required for bonding of a ligand. And in this case, our very first example, we're gonna look at very, very basically, once these TGF beta like ligands bind to those receptors, it causes this SMAD protein to be phosphorylated, which causes changes within the cell. Now let's look at this more specifically. What's interesting about the TGF beta ligands is there's a lot more flexibility and less specificity of those other three than those other three pathways. And so these receptors combine multiple different types of ligands. We have activin, nodal, and uh, TGF beta that we're gonna talk about in this first part. And so whenever they bind one of those three receptors, SMAD2 or SMAD3 get phosphorylated and SMAD4 is recruited and you can change gene expression. However, these same receptors can also recognize and bind to a BMP ligand, so a, th a third different type of ligand. And when that happens through phosphorylation again, so we, in all these cases, the intercellular domain uh, is phosphorylated which interacts with SMAD1 or SMAD5, which is then phosphorylated. It again recruits SMAD4, who then changes gene expression. So these receptors offer a lot more flexibility where you don't need, for example, hedgehog or WNT. They combine a whole bunch of different uh, ligands and sense a bunch of different ligands to affect gene expression. Last thing we're going to talk about here is uh, the example of Notch. And so Notch is a transmembrane protein just like the others. Um, however, instead of interacting with paracrine factors, it interacts with other transmembrane proteins. And so in its inactive state, Notch is a transmembrane protein and it just hangs out here and it has an intercellular domain that is just exposed to proteases and things of that nature. But it just it's not active so nothing can happen and in its standing state there's a repressor protein that is bound to CSL and it represses activation of a target gene so without binding to another extracellular uh, or another cell that has a transmembrane protein there's no gene transcription now if notch is exposed to Delta on a neighboring cell which is another transmembrane protein, what happens is the conformation of notch changes in the intercellular domain. So as you can see here, they kind of tilted it to the side. And that conformational change allows a protease, 
So a enzyme that is that breaks down proteins to kind of cleave off this intercellular domain. And that intercellular domain can then migrate into the nucleus of the cell and it displaces that repressor. So that repressor, is, you can see, is no longer here. It's kicked out. It's gone. And that allows recruitment of other transcription factors to bind with that domain of notch and activate the transcription of this gene. So notch, the takeaway from this is notch is a transmembrane protein that interacts with other transmembrane proteins in neighboring cells and can activate uh, transcription based on the nearby transmembrane proteins. And so this is when we talk about um, depending on your neighbors. Remember we said that um, sometimes if you take cells that have started to specify but you put them with new neighbors that it can change their gene expression and their tissue outcome. And this is an example of that um, with a non-paracrine factor example where interacting directly with proteins on your, the neighboring cells can affect the tissue outcome of not differentiated cells or, or still specifying cells. So that wraps up this chapter. I know this one was dense too, um, and I hope uh, it was pretty clear. I tried to boil it down to the main takeaways. Um, like I said, I'm not expecting you to memorize you know, all these little uh, chaperone proteins and things that play minor roles, but just kind of big concepts from each of these pathways.